I'm Alan Keane, and welcome to Into the Blue. It's a new program to tell you what's going on, who's going up, and who's going down in and around Dublin. Tonight, we're going to see what it's like to be a freelance actor and how they stand as regards social welfare. We'll be talking to Eugene O'Brien, Cotchy Darcy, but most importantly, the man they all want to talk to. And then after that, we'll be taking a look at the rise in teenage horror flicks and just why are they so popular. But first, to Jody and Ronan. They're going to tell us what's happening entertainment-wise in and around Dublin. OK, so Jody, what do you have for us this week? There's a lot of great live gigs coming to Dublin this week. We've got Ray Davies from the Kinks mm -hmm. playing the HQ on Sunday night. We've got Nancy Griffin come to the Olympia with the Blue Moon Orchestra. Um, we've got Al Kramer is coming to the Olympia as well. Shirley Bassey's coming. And um, I mean, there's just a really, really good selection this week okay, coming. So, Ronan, what do you make of those? Um, I'm really looking forward to see Ray Davies. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I would be really kind of interested in seeing kind of anyone else, you know, because, you know, the Kings were a very influential band in the 60s and they've still yeah. left their mark kind of on society. It's kind of one thing everyone says about the Kinks is, you know, the greatest hits albums are good, but the albums are actually better. So for anyone that kind of likes 60 music or the Beatles or anything like that, like the Kinks are kind of and far superior band. Will Ray Davis be playing uh, Kinks material? I believe he's, he's, he's doing spoken word as well, is he? He is. In between songs, he's reading his own poetry and pairing some of his own short stories. Okay. Are well, you familiar with those? I'm not familiar though, but I'd say it'd be a laugh either way, you know? That's very interesting. It's, it'd, be, it'd be interesting, you know? Like, if you're a fan, you'll appreciate it. Like, maybe if you're just somebody that just walks off the street, you know, nothing about the Kinks, you'll go, what the hell's all that about? But mm -hmm. um, I think for kind of fans and stuff like that, they'd really, really appreciate it. So do you think it's a fans only gig? Oh uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think someone could walk in off the street because, you know, you have, you have to understand as well, like kind of all the stuff that went on in the, ki the Kinks, like, you know, um, like there was one gig where they tried to kill them. Uh, one of them, the drummer, tried to kill the singer. <laughs> the one of the two brothers, wasn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah, they were fairly wild, weren't they? they yeah, so and it wasn't publicity stuff. Was this was genuine aggro between the genuine two guys. Genuine aggro, you know. It was real kind of before anything kind of, like they made kind of Liam and Noel's kind of argument seem. Look like, like big ears yeah, and naughty, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's the Kinks, or Ray Davis, and he's on an HQ. So who else do we have coming in? Well, in the next few weeks, there's a great selection of gigs. We've got Public Enemy mm -hmm. coming to the Red Box. Um, Vicar Street brings um, the Aussie Pink Floyd show, which are supposed to be excellent. They're yeah. supposed to be as close as you can get Pink Floyd, to the yeah. real thing. And Point, Counting Crows, right. are coming in June. Um, they've been around for a long time now, and I think they're just trying to make a bit of a touring comeback to right. Ireland. Um, Suzanne Vega is coming to the Olympia, if you can handle it. Mm. Depressing you and know all that. You're not a big fan of Suzanne's, no? No, no. No, how do you write her? Uh, not really much of a fan. Okay. Although, although the um, Public Enemy gig, um, it's a pity, you know, like they, they had great albums in the 80s yeah. and stuff like that, like Fear of a Black Planet and all that. And it's just, it's kind of a pity that they're touring now, kind of right. you know, 10 years later, because... Well, did you know, Public Enemy actually played the Trinity Ball in 1991. Did they? I yes. Yeah, and properly itself, and people climbed over the fences. And I just thought it was kind of odd. Here was Flavor Flav, given at large to a lot of middle class kids yeah. in the seat Trinity. of Trinity <laughs> College about stuff that yeah. nobody had no idea about, you know? So. Yeah. Maybe well, no, a lot of people get a chance to see them again. No, because I remember seeing Run DMC when they came over to Ireland, and you just, you know, everyone thought it's an okay gig though, but yeah. it would have been class if, you know, it was kind of when they were big and touring. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. Like everyone's just kind of. I said there will be a lot now. of old school people who were listening to them when they were sort of thirteen and fourteen, going now, you know, just for like old times' sake. I'd say yeah. they'll get a really good crowd actually. Yeah, so when it's they a come. definitely a good gig oh, yes. to go to. Yeah. Small venue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's one to watch. One to watch. Um, anything else in there? What's what's coming up soon? What's the big gig of? happening definitely pearl jam pearl jam For second, first of june coming to the point mm -hmm. and that's going to be i think it's completely sold out are they the fan, fan of pearl jam oh, i think it. pearl jam was sold out years really? ago i think <laughs> and the first yeah. day they didn't even advertise um, the very first day they were all gone right oh well like they they had one good album like to, to start them off but they've never kind of experimented or anything you know what i mean it's kind right. of been the they've stuck in the same band really. yeah like you know they they, they are a good band and you know, I'm I'm not really a big fan of grunge, so I wouldn't appreciate mm -hmm. it that much. But um, you know, it's just kind of it's just I've always thought with them that they've always kind of brought out the kind of you know we're kind of from Seattle kind of thing and right. just kind of right. rehash it over. So and you think again. they've had they've had a day in the sun, really? I, I think they have. I think this is just kind of for their pensions, this tour right, more than right. anything, you know. So the big one really is is Witness. Is Witness. So what's Witness about and where is it on? Um, it's on in Fairy House. It's kind of um, it's a three day thing. The tickets are going to be about fifty quid. And uh, Guinness are uh, sponsoring it. Um, the 
person to check out is Beck. He hasn't been in Ireland for about three or four years. And his albums are fantastic as well. Plus, as well, the undertones are getting back together for it. And uh, Paul Ballard's going. And plus, as well, nearly every Irish act you can think of will be playing at it as well. It's definitely okay. one you have to So, Witness to. is the one to look for. Okay, yeah. so we're just going to move on now. We're going to move on to cinema. Okay, what's the big cinema film this week? Okay, definitely Gladiator. Gladiator, oh, yeah. I see it Gladiator. Like it is incredible. It's great. Really very excellent. Ridley Scott yeah. directed it. And um, it's just, I mean, it's completely. This genre hasn't been done in so long. It's like bringing back Spartacus, kind of Ben Hur, yeah. and um, they've just done an excellent job. Stars and sandals, you know? And of course, it was Oliver Reed's last film. How I know, is he? He he. I mean, he died during the making yeah, of it. Yeah, that's he, right. He was very good. I mean, absolutely. Apparently, I found out that he only got about um, sort of forty-five percent of the shots done that he was supposed to be in, right. and for the rest, they've had to use trick photography CGI and all. CGI and whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. And I, just, yeah. But in, I didn't even know while I was watching the movie. Yeah. I found out afterwards that he had died during the making, yeah. so I didn't notice at all. No, and he was, he was very good and it was excellent in it, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's probably one of his better roles. Is it roles. a film for squeamish people? There's a lot of blood and gore in it. There is there a lot of blood and gore in it. Yeah, there is, like, but the, the best thing about it is, like, you know, you always see this old Colosseum, but they recreate the kind of Colosseum with kind of digital technology. Right. And it's just when they're in there fighting and stuff, you can get this kind of great atmosphere from the crowd and, you know, you can, you feel really a part of it like yeah. that when you're watching it. Plus as well, like, the opening scene as well, like, when you, it's a fight scene. Uh, where the Romans are attacking some bar barbarians or something. Yeah. And that is so well done. Like it's, you know it's been compared to the opening scenes of um, Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. Right. But yeah. apparently nowhere near as gory or, right. or it doesn't affect you as much. But I think that they weren't going for that. They were right. going for much more of a sort of a grand... And what's uh, Russell Crowe like? Russell Crowe is amazing. World's best film. New Zealand actor. But the only New Zealand actor, absolutely. I think. No, he's absolutely yeah. amazing in the film. They couldn't affect it. Picked a better actor. Yeah, he's really good. But so you know, definitely Gladiator is one to watch. Yeah. Most what most else have you caught recently, Ronan? Uh, the Man on the Moon. Um, it's a bit, um, when you go and see it, kind of like you have to know a bit, a tiny bit about Andy Kaufman because Jim Carrey is dead serious the whole way through it. He doesn't tell any jokes. He's right. like goofy. It, it is a very kind of serious film though, but I was amazed actually how well Jim Carrey actually pulled it off. Like he was very, very mm. convincing in the role. Yeah. You know, kind of even there was reports and all that when they were making the film that he was going around ringing up friends, pretending to be Andy right. Kaufman, you know, um, saying a lot of people said he went schizo and all that, right. you know, the usual kind of tabloid stuff. There's talk of uh, wrestler Jerry the King Lawler really actually trying to break his neck. Yeah. So the, maybe he should have <laughs> succeeded, really. Um, we're going to move on now to the videos. Two big videos this week. Um, I would say the two best videos of recent releases are um, Sixth Sense and Fight Club. Yeah, they're very good. Um, yeah, they're both excellent films. Mm -hmm. Fight Club is definitely my number one. Right. Secondly. Why? Brad Pitt? Not at all. If I was going to go for one, it'd be Edward Norton, definitely really? over Brad Pitt. But um, no, it's just an excellent film. I mean, well, well made film. Yeah. You know? I mean, they've used a lot of techniques now. I mean, I mean, it's the best voiceover I've ever seen. Right. You know, done in films recently. And um, the thing about Sixth Sense and Fight Club is there's a twist in both of them. Yeah. And, um, and you know, towards the end. And um, I think that it's done better in Sixth Sense in than Sixth it's in Fight Club. I it's certainly think, having seen both films twice. It's a film that you enjoy the second time around Absolutely, because yeah. both of them, because you, you're able to see the stuff and you're, you're going, ah, that's that and that, you know, exactly. and certainly yeah. films that are worth the second viewing. You wonder how you didn't see it on the first mm -hmm. go, yeah. you know. I think the thing I like most about them is when you're walking down the road the next day after walking home at night, you're kind of a bit terrified, you know. Yeah. M maybe from the twist at the end, I can't give too much away, but they're, they're definitely worth checking out anyway. Yeah. Okay. So definitely a yeah, big film there for Bruce Willis and... Uh, Brad Pitt. Yeah. So what else do we have at the moment? We have a uh, theatre. What's happening theatre-wise at the moment? Well, theatre-wise, I would just want to see uh, George Bernard Shaw play. It's in the um, Bewley's Cafe Theatre mm -hmm. on Grafton Street. I went to see it this week. It's a really fantastic. It's um, How He Lied to Her Husband. Okay. That's probably the best one I've definitely seen in recent right. times, but there is a lot going on at the moment. Things that are finishing up and that you'd want to go and see soon are in the Peacock Theatre brings us Tree Houses by Elizabeth Cutty. So that's finished up on the 20th, so only a few more days to go okay. and see that. Um, Anders Lane is The Creatures. Um, uh, going to just the end of May as well, so that's that's going to be finished up soon. The Crypt Arts Centre is the hypochondriac directed by Dara Collins, and that's presented by Dry Ice. And the Gaiety Theatre brings us the plan of the star starring Stephen Ray. So that's one not to Big be Big star back in Dublin. Absolutely. So certainly there's a lot happening theatre-wise yeah. in Dublin at the moment, music-wise and cinema-wise. I mean, no matter what you're into, there's, a, there's a lot happening at the moment. Yeah. So listen, I just want to thank you very much for coming in, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Do you ever walk around? and hear two sets of footsteps. But when you turn around, nobody is there. Do you sit at home watching television with shivers running down your spine? When you're in the shower, does it feel like people are staring at you? Do you hear things that go bump in the night? 
Well, if you do, it was probably... Bill! You know, since the dawn of man, murder and bloodshed have been our greatest fear. A life so simple, snatched away with the pull of a trigger or the sinking of a knife. Not since the glory days of Wells and Hitchcock have screams so loud and so piercing been heard emanating from our cinema theatres. Our story begins eight years ago, when the film Buffy the Vampire Slayer was released. In 1996, a television series was created around the film, and that sent even more chills down our spine. Could it possibly be that the children of our generation weren't horrified enough? Who knows? It certainly seems that way, looking at some more recent horror movies, such as the devilishly spooky Scream, or even The Faculty, or what about my favorite, Halloween H2O? Well, that's it for the first half. We all like to think that actors live a luxurious life, whether it's going to a film premiere or a soiree or the opening night of a new Broadway play. That's, of course, when they're not splashed across the pages of a low magazine. But in reality, for most actors, it's indeed very, very different. Generally, their lives are spent going from one audition to the next, not really knowing where the next paycheck is coming from. And in a profession that sees most actors unemployed for an incredible 80% of the time, the reality is very different indeed. They only really hope for a regular income, but as Eugene O'Brien has found out, for an actor, this can be very, very difficult. In a segment we like to call Jack Hughes, Eugene took one of our cameras to show what real life is like for an actor. This is Apollo House Social Welfare Office, which I have had to frequent on and off over recent years. I've often found the staff in here very helpful, very courteous, sort of my claim out without any bother. So what's the problem? Well, last May I came in here to sign on and I was told that I was not entitled to social welfare if I was unwilling to take up alternative employment, that is, employment outside the acting field. And despite letters from both myself and Equity outlining my experience, commitment and involvement in the acting profession, I was taken off the live register. I am not alone. This is happening to more and more of my colleagues. So anyway, the story continued. I lodged an appeal. I went to the appeals hearing, uh, presented my defence and promptly won my case. Terrific. So yes, you are entitled to be an actor in modern day Ireland. If, and um, this is the big if, if you manage to work all the time. Because I was then warned in letter form that if I happened to be unemployed for a certain amount of time, I would be yet again brought back into Apollo House and asked questions. There are actors who have entertained us for years in world famous Irish plays and films. Are they, having hit a lean spot in their career, expected to work behind a till? I think that actors contribute a great deal to the cultural life of this country, representing the country around the world. And I can guarantee you that every actor from Liam Neeson and Gabriel Byrne have had to rely on social welfare at one time or another. The problem, I think, is that the policymakers do not understand the realities of being a full-time actor. Any actor who is fully committed to the profession will be seeking work all the time. This is a full-time occupation in itself. Every door has to be knocked on, from theatre, television, film, to voiceovers, ads, corporates, radio drama, etc. I have worked in all of these areas in the last two years, but unfortunately contracts are short, jobs rotate. 100% employment is simply not possible. But there is no actor I know who does not want to work. finish up, I would ask the policymakers to try and recognise the fact that you cannot simply lump actors in with the rest of the 9 to 5 population. Now, I recognise the government's anxiousness to fill the surplus jobs that we have in our country at the moment, but hounding a small, dedicated group of the workforce off the dole does not, to me, seem very fair. Thanks for listening.
So I'm joined now by Eugene O'Brien and Kochi Darcy. Eugene is a freelance actor and writer, and Kochi uh, has worked as an actor for over 15 years in London and has experienced the same type of problems. So first I'll go to you, Eugene. Uh, could you just fill me in a bit more about what exactly happened to you? Uh, well, I went to sign on last year, and uh, I mean, I've been working quite a lot the last few years, so it wasn't the case of that, you know, I had been signing on for a year or two without mm -hmm. doing anything. And I always found social welfare people to be really helpful and no problem there at all. And then there was a kind of a group manager guy who was very abrupt and basically was saying to me, you know, uh, I don't really believe you're a full-time actor. I don't really believe that you right. really are serious about this. It's just kind of a thing. It's a hobby. A hobby yeah. And like you like to take money off the government and um, this kind of stuff. Very disparaging, very upsetting kind of stuff. And Eugene, uh, do you think you were singled out or do you think this is a across-the-board policy? No, it's a, it's a cross the board policy. The social welfare, one of the social welfare officers said that to me. He said, look, it's, a, it's, it's coming down from the top. Right. Uh, the progressive Democrats uh, seem to be the ones named who are into this. And uh, so that's fine. Like, we're all being, right. they see us as uh, able-bodied uh, people who could take up work in okay. any other area. Okay, and I'll just go off the catch you on this one. Um, how does this compare to your experience? Well, I can remember, I think it was about 85, and I was told by the Social Security in London that uh, you will be cut off your dole if you do not go on this course. And so I had to go on a course for a week. Right. And um, off I went for my course, and I was thrown in with what I can only describe as, well, the most peculiar people, and they were quite a selection now. I mean, one poor man, um, he must have been in his 60s, he was Asian, and he couldn't write his name. Okay. There was another young fellow of about 19, and he wanted to be a rock star, and there was a couple of others, there was about 10 of us in so the group. So these people were, n were not they professional actors no, in the same way that no. Eugene, where they, they pursued a profession. No, I was the only one on, on okay. this course, mm. uh, strangely. But the, <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, what we had to do on this course was we had to act. Right. Uh, we had to act out mm. the scenario of going for a job in order to gain confidence. Right. And we had to learn how to write a CV. And we had to learn how to approach an interview. Okay. I mean, and these the are all good skills, but you'd, you'd been, you were above that. You'd already done that type of stuff. Well, I'd done, done my improvisation thing. classes at RADA, thank yeah. you very much. And uh, mm. I just thought this was hysterically funny. But I had to go through it. Okay. And uh, this is, as I say, when Maggie... Thatcher so this was Thatcherism at This was at Thatcher its, its right. at her height, and this was the way it was then. And I have to say, I didn't know it was the way things were going here now. Mm. And I well would like to say... it's a recent manifestation. Uh, it's kind of happened in the last year and a half. And I can understand, you know, I, mean, I can understand the government's uh, wanting to fill the, the many positions that we have well, in this country. Exactly, and, you but you mean, we're, in, we're in a country that it's some professions, there are more jobs than there are applicants. Yeah. So surely, I mean, realistically, um, if you're not doing acting work, you're available. Yeah. So why can you not take up a job? In well, I think profession? that it depends. Like, if you're a full-time actor and if you're serious about it, you're, like, you're looking for work all the time. Mm. Okay. Uh, you have an agent, in fact, that, that you pay to find your work. Mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, is that typical of, of other um, professions, or is that exclusive to the acting? Well, it is well, exclusive to the acting yeah. Uh, yeah. profession, obviously. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone else pays them to find the work. Yeah. Also, it's very short-term contracts. It's you can go for 10 uh, interviews a year and get half of them or six of them. Uh, that still means you mightn't work all year. Sure. It's, it's just the nature of the business. Yes, that's you know. an interesting thing. And I'll go to Kochi on that one. Could you just go through a kind of typical working pattern for actors? Is it like you, get, you do one job interview and then you have a job for two years, four years? It could be like okay. that. But I mean, the fact of the matter is you have to be on the end of that phone the whole time. Mm -hmm. You have to keep your ear to the ground. You cannot rely on your agent. And if you do, you are a fool, believe you me. Um, because there's a lot of agents out there who just lunch. Yeah. So you're constantly working. You're constantly keeping your ear to the ground the whole time. And it, is, it, it does wear you down. Yeah. OK, you could go for an interview and you may feel, oh, God, I've really got the part. And you knew you did well and you're so hopeful. Mm. And then the next day you get the call saying you didn't get it and you torment yourself as to why didn't mm. I get it and it would turn out later they didn't like the cut of your nose sure yeah something like this because it could be for a mm. teleplay or a, an ad or something like that it the, the parameters so are such so big that you know, you can't beat yeah. yourself so up unlike um, other professions I don't know if 
for example, an electrician. If you're a good electrician, you're a good electrician. You're a good actor, but you just mightn't be right, and you mightn't get work. Yeah, you just certain. mightn't be right for that particular mm -hmm. yes. thing. Although you could be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you know. And yeah. things can run. I mean, some like people can work for maybe five to six years. They can work. They get loads of work. I mean, yeah, have good run. In the last year, or whatever, it is kind of for two years. I worked in every single medium it was possible to do. Mm. I was laughing. I was. It was. Yeah. It was fine. But then things can can stop. It just uh, and it's very unfortunate when that happens. But uh, I, I just wonder: Do people in power, people in government, really understand what it's like mm -hmm. to actually be an actor? Do they think it's a hobby that you could do at night? And mm. how do you know the great Irish plays and the great Irish films and stuff that get on and win Tonys and Oscars, mm -hmm. which which well, I mean always seem to be there? That's certainly the thing to, to when uh, the Brenda, Brenda Fricker and Daniel Day Lewis came mm -hmm. home with their Oscars. You know, people, politicians were queuing up to meet them and slap yeah. their back. The same it's also with Riverdance people. Yeah. and yeah, but I uh, bet they Martin queued, McDonough plays, I bet you they know. queued up for the dole in their time. You know, these, yes, are, these people, when, when success is there, they, they, mm. they seem to want to be a part of it. Yeah, but well, yeah. I, know, I know an actor who's now doing his play in the Abbey, and he's, he works an, a lot now. But, I mean, he, has, he said to me that, like, in the 80s, when things were bad, and he was living in a bed, sitting rat mines, and was doing shows for free, you, which you have to do to get experience mm -hmm. and to learn your craft, uh, put your face about his, the dole kept him going. Yeah. He didn't have time to worry. The dole kept him going. And he said if it hadn't been for the dole, he would have had to go home. He would have gone back to Limerick and got a job in his father's farm mm -hmm. or whatever. You, know what I mean? there, you have to, you either want the drama and the arts or you don't. Mm. And I mean, if you don't want them, don't pretend profession, that you want them. really, isn't it? Yes. You know, you're yeah, dictated but, but by... You know, by and there has to be some to kind of policy. I mean, I think the, the social welfare people, I have nothing against them. Mm. They're just... It's they're doing their job. They're doing their job. And I think it's up to equity as well, who were supposed to be here today and, yes. and aren't. It's up to them. They've got to start mm. moving towards getting some kind of legislation going for actors. Writers get tax-free yes. stuff. Never uh, actors, stuff Actually, you know, the rates, I mean, uh, as far as I know, this, the equity minimum rate is £170, mm. which is really a disgrace. I mean, that's the minimum wage. And that's in a job where you're getting paid wages. I can assure you that's not £5 an hour. You know, so, I mean... Yeah. Realistically, when you are working, you can't save that much. To no, you can't. Even if you're, I mean, I did. So you need the dole, really. Yeah, I mean, I did the, the telly for uh, two years, on and off, as well as other stuff. So I was earning mm -hmm. a fair bit of money. But at the same time, you have to be very careful with it because you mightn't work then. Yeah. For your, or the next time you're in mightn't be like for four weeks. I was actually talking to a woman from Foss recently who said, next to actors, uh, most of the people now are in boy bands. Yeah. <laughs> so, which, I mean, we're laughing about, but because we're involved, we think, you know, well, we're actors, you know. So listen, I'm just going to wrap it up there, but I'd just like to say that um, I think the situation is definitely going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. Very I'd like worrying. to thank Eugene, and I'd like to thank Karch for coming thank in. You. Thank you very Cheers. much. Bye. Unfortunately, now we've reached the end of the show, and I'd like to thank all my guests. And until we meet again, it's goodbye. And here to play us out, here's Presence with Nova. <laughs>